Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. Once again tonight in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update. <sighs> a wonderful, wonderful man who I'm so glad to have met years and years ago, but just via internet. We have never met personally, probably will never meet personally, but the fantastic thing is that when you have a brother in Christ, you don't even need to meet him in person because you know that the same spirit leads you into the same old truth. And that's so wonderful and why we are going to continue this uh, study of uh, the Roman Catholic Socialist agenda for the moment we are dealing with evangelicals and Catholics together. A chapter of the wonderful book Code World Babylon Part 2, Antichrist as a Woman, Alive and Well Again. There is so much to say, there is so much to study, there is so much to tell that we just will never have time enough to do so. But as I said this afternoon, when I was reading another part of Yea, I've God Said in this wonderful book by U.H. Stennis, I sat there and Tom will absolutely join me in, in that in that chorus to say, you have to make this information that you are given here your own by doing your own study and by confirming everything that we say and holding it against the Bible so that you can see that you only keep the truth. You, as Tom says, meet, eat the meat and spit out the bones, but you have to own the information. All this information you get here in this video is worth nothing, absolutely nothing, if you do not engage yourself in your own research in this regard and confirm the things that's, that we say here and by that then really make this your own information. I think that is a very, very important point. I never want to neglect that. And for the moment, we are still in the wonderful times. I mean, we are not living in wonderful times anyway in this world, but, you know, at least now we still have the possibilities to get a lot of stuff. Get books, real books, printed books, paper books, hold them in your hand. You never know what happens to the quote-unquote digital world. You never know what happens to all your PDF books, whether you can still read them, open them, use them in the future. But a book that you can hold in your hand, that's something that will take very, very long for them to take away. So as long as you have the possibility, get these books, read these books, read them together with us, watch our reading of books. I mean, Tom has done so many book readings, I can't even count them. I just started in uploading a new series of him from 2013, that is uh, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And that book, I can tell you, is so fascinating. I've listened to 13 or 14 parts already, and I'm just like, I've never heard anything like that before. It is incredible what that author all has to say, and more incredible even are Tom's comments on that. Well, who is Tom? Well, the guy that you hear right here. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Yurt. Nice to be with you. And, uh... And to speak to the listeners again about uh, the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order and the uh, the global redistribution of the world's wealth in the name of Roman Catholic social doctrine, and uh, and uh, showing not only the theory behind it, which uh, uh, P. Uh, P. D. Stewart does so eloquently in his book, but to show also, the facts on the ground that verify that this isn't just hot air, uh, that th this is really being implemented right now before our very eyes. We can all witness it for ourselves. We don't have to take anybody's word for it. And uh, once you comprehend what's really going on in the world right now with the ecumenical movement and uh, Roman Catholic social doctrine being implemented all over the world, not just the United States, and you can verify it for yourself, then everything we else, everything else that we say about the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order becomes facts on the ground. You can see it for yourself, and you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to take Yerk's word for it. You've seen it for yourself. You've done your own research, and now you own the information. That's just an attempt to elaborate a little bit further on what Yerk was saying in the, in, in the introduction about owning this information. You see, if, if you just take my word for it, 
or if you just take Yerk's word for it and you don't verify any of these things for yourself, you don't own it. You don't have any ownership of this information. In other words, you don't have any responsibility for this information. And if pressure, if push comes to shove, or as uh, many would like to say, when the S hits the fan, uh, you can deny, oh, that's what Tom thinks, or that's what Yerk thinks, or, or I've heard that before, but I don't necessarily believe it. Uh, See, so you can deny. But this, this information can't be denied. I mean, so at some point, we have to take responsibility for what we believe. I mean, that's the case with the gospel, isn't it? Nobody can save you. Only Christ can save you. Uh, somebody can, issue, can, 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 can give you the gospel, but unless you read it for yourself, continue in his word daily, affirming these things constantly on your own, you own that salvation. You own that gospel. But if you never were to read the Bible, well, Yerk said that if I believe in Jesus, I'm saved. Or Tom said, if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth, you, you know, the Lord will confess you before his Father in heaven. But that's what Yerk and Tom think. No, no, no. It, it's too late for that kind of childishness. We need to own what we believe. And... Uh, so, so that's just my iteration, my little elaboration of what Yerk was uh, uh, describing in the introduction. And our, and our subject has been now, in, in P.D. Stewart's book, uh, the, the, uh, the Antichrist is a Woman Alive and Well Again. We're talking about uh, the unification or the ecumenical movement to unite the Protestants back into the Roman Catholic Church. And, and then to adopt and implement, whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, Roman Catholic social doctrine, which is the universal destination of goods, according to their definition, means that every item of goods in this world, whether it be houses, lands, food, automobiles, even air, coal, energy, fuel, gasoline, oil, uh, uh, it all has upon it a, what they call a prior social mortgage. Okay, that's just gobbledygook until I define it for you. What that mean is, is everything has upon it a universal destination. Okay, you, you may say you own your automobile. You may be able to produce title and uh, call it yours. But if somebody coming across the border down in Texas decides he needs a vehicle, if he has need, he can take your vehicle and he commits no sin. Now, the Bible calls that theft. The God of gods calls that stealing. But we don't serve the God of gods in this physical world. We serve the Antichrist. And he says everything has upon it a universal destination. Everything upon it has a prior social mortgage. In other words, you can show the mortgage for your house. You can show title <coughs> and valid claim of ownership to your house. But if you go away on a two-week vacation, you come back, there are squatters living in your house, you can't kick them out because they have need. So this is where the universal destination of goods becomes material reality in this country. Here, Yerk has asked me to comment upon uh, the current invasion that's taking place, or it has been taking place in the United States for uh, well over 40 years now. And that is that our southern border is wide open to invasion. Uh, C Cubans, year decades ago, the, the Mariel boat lift, the southern border, Cubans were flooded in, into this country. Now it's Mexico, Central and South America, and even Asians, Indians, uh, uh, people from every nation all over the world flooding into this country. Just a, second, in, 
Yes, Just a second, ahead. if I interrupt here, Tom. Uh, also, that is nothing new under the sun. In the 19th right. century, America was quote unquote importing millions of Irish Catholics. Right. And those, uh, how do you call them, descendants of those people coming into your country in the 19th century, especially under the working of Jesuit generals Rotan and Bex, are today people like the Kennedy family, which has Irish roots, the sure. Biden family, which has Irish roots, the Reagan, Reagan family, family, which has Irish roots, yeah, thank you, which has <laughs> Irish roots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you see how they use these people. It's exactly right. It takes a lot of time, or it took a lot of time. But, you know, when you plant a flower seed today, you don't expect them to go into blow, full blow tomorrow, right? It needs time and it needs to be nourished. It's the same all over again as in the wonderful book that Tom read years ago, which is worth not a cent if you're not listening to the reading of Tom of that book, The Ark and the Dove. Mm -hmm. That also was the preparation of the ground, the seeding, the maintaining, mm -hmm. and in the end it was the harvest, right? I, uh, along these same lines, I believe you mentioned before the program that uh, you're currently listening to my reading and discussion of R.W. Thompson's book. Basically yeah, the most, power. most wonderful work. R.W. Oh. Thompson, the, uh, Ro uh, the Papacy and Civil uh, Power. Incredible mm -hmm. book. Yeah, yeah. It, will be, it, will be it, it will be uploaded on my, um, uh, on my, on my channel, in, uh, I think, from May or, or June on, on my Joggler's War and Disinfo channel. Yeah, please continue, Tom. Well, in that book, I believe it's that book, and many others, I get them confused because so many of them cover much of the same ground. But uh, uh, I, it was when uh, Pope Pius the Ninth uh, declared, you know, the, the syllabus of error. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just at that moment when you are reading that. Um, Pope Pius the Ninth syllabus of error was published in 1864. Uh, in which he, in some 75 different points, condemned uh, uh, freedom of thought, uh, freedom of religion, uh, all kinds of free uh, governments, which is mm -hmm. a government uh, from the, uh, of the people, by the people, for the people, like uh, United States of America is. Um, and then few ye two years later, um, there was a meeting... <laughs> of American bishops going over to the Vatican and confirming to Pope Pius IX that they completely understood his syllabus of errors That's and right. that they are putting everything in their power to make sure that in the United States of America all these points will be followed. This is, right. this is just what I listened to this weekend. Yeah, Tom, absolutely. This is just yeah. incredible. Okay. And if you understand, now we're just touching on that book a little bit. I wish we could explain further for the listeners, but they can listen to your reading and discussion of it. But uh, <clears throat> Oh, it's your uh, reading and discussion, it, Tom. Anyway. It's your anyway, reading and what, discussion. What? It's just, I, yes. I just oh. put up the videos. It's this book here. So, so what, what came of this was what was called a holy alliance. And that's when the the uh, the powers that be in Europe, in other words, the uh, de jure governments of Europe, those who serve the papacy, uh, joined in league to flood this country with Roman Catholics. It was Austria was one of them. Uh, you'll read about it in the book. I, in my memory, if my memory serves me correctly, Austria, Italy. Uh, some other countries over there. It was a, it was kind of a triad of of nations that set what they called the Holy Alliance, and they were allied, allied, on on one endeavor, and that is to uh, force immigration to the United States, force Roman Catholic immigration to the United States, 
And what they did was they emptied the prisons of those nations and, and put them on ships and brought them over here. And that's why the cities became so violent in, the, in this country, because all the Roman Catholic prisons were, were emptied and they were put on trains and ships and sent to this country and do you to, know? Occupy, to <laughs> occupy the major cities, the largest <laughs> cities in this country, and they did the same thing with the Irish, with the so-called uh, Irish potato famine, to, to force Roman Catholic Irish into this country. That's why Ireland is so powerful. That's why I, the Irish are so powerful in New York City. They sent them to New York City, Boston, Baltimore, all the major cities up and down the, the eastern seaboard, and in order to control politics, okay? And that is to make America Catholic. Do you know where okay. that has a precedent, Tom? Sorry to interrupt you here, but do you know where that has a precedent, emptying the prisons and sending them all over to that country? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the Crusades. Sure. During the first That's... Crusades, the Roman Catholic Church opened the prisons and gave the people full indulgence if they fought for the papacy and they were even promised land afterwards. Right. And you can go to the south of France today in, this, in, in the region of uh, Perpignan, which is a city on the southwestern uh, part of France near the F Spanish border. And there you still have Templar ground. So that is ground from the uh, order of the Templars that were the crusaders in the uh, 11th and 12th century. And there they planted vineyards because that's all ground that they got from the Roman Catholic Church. And they make up to today a very special sweet red wine there in that region, which is called Banyuls, B-A-N-Y-U-L-S, Banyuls. So this is nothing new. Emptying the prisons and using them for Roman Catholic agenda, Tom? <laughs> they did that thousand years ago already. <laughs> But nobody remembers. <laughs> That's right. We've forgotten already. And, the, and they gave them all plenary indulgence. So whatever crimes they committed while they were fighting the Crusades in order to Catholicize the East, the East uh, whatever sin they committed would be automatically forgi forgiven them in the Roman Catholic Church. And so this is why you see so many blue and green-eyed babies all over where nobody can explain why there are so many blue and green-eyed babies. Well, because they were, you know, they were rapists. They couldn't commit a sin so they could have all the women they wanted, and they did. That's why the Crusades have a reputation for being so brutal, so utterly brutal. And... Uh, this is, this is what happens when the papacy issues plenary indulgence. Uh, you, if, you know, if you'll go on this endeavor, on this crusade to Catholicize the Middle East, all your sins will be forgiven you. So you go not only to kill, thou shalt not kill, but you go to kill and you go to rape and pillage and steal lands and towns and villages and <coughs> anything and everything. Well, nothing's changed except the calendar date. And what we have now flooding across the border of the United States down in Texas is, an, is a 40-year-long deluge of Catholics or non-Protestants flooding into this country and taking over jobs, taking over land, taking over houses, taking over automobiles, taking over American lives, and the government is supporting them. Now, why would the American government support such a thing? Because I've been telling the listeners for nigh under 25 years, the papacy is the king of kings and the lord of lords. And when he says he's going to redistribute the world's wealth, that's what he means and every politician of any rank in this country knows that if he doesn't go along with the Pope's agenda, he could be JFK'd at high noon with cameras rolling and nobody's going to go to jail. And so they all cooperate. And Biden is a card-carrying 
Jesus cookie eating Roman Catholic. And so is his wife, and so is all of his family, most of which are Jesuit trained. And they're not going to close the border. They're opening the border of Texas so that all the Roman Catholics and all the degenerate third world non-Protestant heretics can come across this country and turn Protestantism into a meager uh, uh, minority, a powerless minority. And they're redistributing our wealth. They're taking our bank accounts. You watch and see. You think it's, this is nonsense. You watch and see. The economy's about to tank. And all the wealth that used to be ours is going to belong to somebody else. Our houses, our land, our properties, everything has upon it a universal destination. We, we And anybody who's listened to me any length of time or anybody among us who is a Roman Catholic, they'll all tell you without asking, the word universal is just another word for Catholic. They are just two different spellings of the same word. So the universal destination of good, when it comes out of the Pope's mouth, it means the Roman Catholic destination of goods. And that's where it is. That's what's happening right now before your very eyes on all the cameras and what I don't want the listeners to be deceived by is this apparent opposition set up by the government of Texas and 25 other states in the United States who say they're going to close that border. And if they have to, they're going to have a shooting war with the federal government. It's all a bunch of theater. It's no, nobody's going to stop the flood of un-Americans, Roman Catholic hordes, Crusaders, if you will, Roman Catholic crusaders, emptied prisons, coming across the border. They're lawless, and they're doing the Pope's bidding. They may not know it, but they're doing what the Pope wants done, a complete and total and forever overthrow of Protestantism in this country. Listen, Protestantism was the only thing that ever threatened, seriously threatened, the Pope and his throne. Okay? The truth of the Bible is the papacy's worst enemy. And it was the Protestants who said the Bible and the Bible alone. No popes, no councils, no cardinals, no bishops, no rituals, no... no no sacraments. We want the Bible and the Bible alone. Well, the Bible and the Bible alone liberated the whole world from papal control. And yep. if, it, if it were still Protestantism, the world would still be against the papacy. But Protestantism is dead because they believed in futurism. Have a look okay? at, the, I, at the screen, Tom, please. Have a look at the screen. You, you see the meaning of the word ecumenical taken from a dictionary. Ecumenical, yeah. of course, is written with a very special letter. That's why you find it not so easy in that uh, dictionary. It is an O and an E. I hope you see that. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah. So that's uh, and it is spelled ecumenical. It comes from the Greek. But interesting is the very, the very first year indication after the word. Uh, when you read the second uh, when you read ecumenical and then a what is the uh, the year that you see behind that Tom 1563 what is 1563 representing Council of Trent the end of the Council of Trent yeah because yep. that took place between 1545 and 1563 so at that the end when... so at the end of the of, of, of the Council of Trent the bloody counter-reformational council that was called and organized and run by the Jesuit order ended in 1563 and all of a sudden you see the word ecumenical popping up. Belonging to or representing the whole, and I'm glad it says between brackets, Christian world, <laughs> because Catholicism is not Christianity, or the universal church, general, universal, Catholic, specially applied to the general councils of the early church. Yeah, 
even the Council of uh, Nicaea was an ecumenical church in that regard. That's right. Mm -hmm. And in modern use to, of the Roman Catholic Church, also assumed as a title by the Patriarch of Constantinople, which is the uh, alter ego of the Pope in the Western Roman Catholic Church, formerly mm -hmm. sometimes applied to the Pope of Rome. And mm -hmm. the second meaning is universal, general, worldwide. This is from 1607. Hence, ecumenalism, the theological system or doctrine of the ecumenical councils. But just the time, 1563, it just beat me over the head. I thought that's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's just, you know, that's confirming everything that you and I have ever said about the Jesuits right. and, 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 well, and the, and the Jesuit, and the Jesuit led Vatican New World Order, uh, uh, New World Order agenda, as you always say. That this is proof on the ground, even from a dictionary. Yeah. And the only thing that this definition that you see here under ecumenism, the only thing that it lacks is a further definition that it includes the whole world, not just the so-called, quote-unquote, Christian world, which isn't Christianity anyway. Yeah, but that's but why Christian is in, in brackets, Tom. Yeah, right. But Belonging it, but it, to or representing it, but it, the whole world. But, yeah. it, but it includes the whole world. Yeah. Muslim, uh, uh, Shinto, uh, uh, Buddhist, the whole world is... Look, the Pope is the god of gods in this world. Okay? Everything that the Bible says belongs to Jehovah is, is, is put upon the papacy by his own power. And, and the Pope calls himself the God of Gods. And that's why, that's why at Assisi, when the, when the Pope gathered all the religious leaders of the world, they showed up. They actually showed up and shared their power with him. Okay? It, it's a global religion. And, there, and there's only one religion that's excluded from this global religious kumbaya, and that's Bible-believing Protestantism that says the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And not only that, but Jesus is the only hope of man. That's what defines biblical Protestantism. Any departure from that is no longer biblical Christianity. And it is counter-Christianity. Look, Roman Catholicism is no more Christian than, than, is, than is Islam. Okay? It's, it's no more Christianity than Hinduism. But the papacy has been acknowledged in this world as the god of gods. All the gods of this world answer to the pope. And here you see a picture of them. And, and it's one thing, it's, it's just wonderful about Yerk. He can produce these images that confirm what I say about this global ecumenical movement. Not just being Christian. It's not just, it's not just Roman Catholicism with Orthodox Catholicism, uh, or rather Greek or Eastern Orthodox, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's not just Protestant and Catholic and Orthodox, the, the, the so-called Christian religions. It's every religion of every kind. Every God bows in his knee to the God of God sitting there in the middle of that photograph in white and red, little red shoes. Okay? And, and you know, it, the, the, the delusion is, is, is right in front of your face. And the papacy has just the same uh, 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 self-image about the goods of this world as he does about the gods of this world. They're all his. The papacy says of himself, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. That is, everything that is in it is mine. Okay? I'm the God of gods. I am the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you must be subject to the Roman Catholic pontiff. To be for saved. Your salvation, yes. Unam right. sanctum. It's a it's a salvific issue. You must be subject to the Holy Roman Pontiff. Okay, so it's global. It that is ecumenical, 
which is that adds a third element to the word ecumenism that's not included in, in the definition that you gave, the, the definition that you showed uh, from the dictionary. Ecumenism includes not just, quote unquote, the Christian religion, but every religion, every God. That's what ecumenical is. It says here, and, hence ecumenalism, the theological system or doctrine of the ecumenical councils. Yeah, under yeah. two, you see, ecumenism, ecumenicalism, so so it's in there. But, you know, this is just a little uh, photo out of the dictionary, of course. I think the whole articles will be a little, or the whole page will be a little longer, but ecumenicalism is in there. Ecumenism is not in there, but that also depends on how old um, the dictionary is. I mean, when we go to... Uh, Webster's 1828, that is a good dictionary, right? Yeah. I love that one. And when we put that out and we have a look at ecumenism, uh, it doesn't know ecumenism, it knows ecumenic. And then it's ecumenical, the habited word general universal as an ecumenical council. The word ecumenism is Catholic. Yeah, it doesn't even know the word ecumenism. That means ecumenism in itself is a newer word because that the dictionary is from 1828. Ecumenism is a new uh, introduced word then. Here you have ecumenicalism, which is almost the same, but you know. I don't even want to go into discussion about this. The point is um, that. Uh, what it says here and what you were so explaining so well, Tom, belonging to or representing the whole world, mm -hmm. not Christian, the whole world the whole or world. the universal church out of yeah. which there is no salvation. That's Pope right. Boniface VIII said in 1302 in his bull, um, Unam Sanctum. Unam Sanctum. It is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human soul to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. That's right. And that is still valid today because a bull, a papal bull, after publication, becomes part of Roman Catholic canon law. That's right. And that law has never changed. <laughs> It is like the church, semper adem. It does not change. Okay. Now, if I may finish my point. Please, please. All, all the goods in this country uh, can't be loaded up on ships and sent to the Roman Catholic countries, right? <laughs> your house, your land. If the Pope says that there, everything has upon it a prior social mortgage, which is key indication that it, it falls under Roman Catholic social doctrine. It has upon it a prior social mortgage uh, that it has a universal or Catholic destination. Then they have to open the borders and let Catholics come and get it, don't they? You can't ship your land to Catholic countries to serve the Catholics. So they open the borders and let the Catholics come in here to enjoy their land. And that even reminds me, my, my gosh, about uh, 20 years ago, I believe it was, maybe 15, a video showed up on YouTube and Nancy Pelosi uh, was in a church in Southern California a Roman Catholic church in Southern California. And it was full of Roman Catholic invaders who had just come across the Mexican border. And, 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 and Nancy Pelosi, Roman Catholic Nancy Pelosi, she's an admitted Roman Catholic, Speaker of the House at the time, if I'm not mistaken, addressed this clandestine group of fresh invaders into this country from Mexico. And somebody in that congregation had a, uh, a miniature camera or something in their purse or in their pocket. 
and they recorded this. They showed just enough video that I could see one of the niches in the wall of the church, on the interior wall of the church, where they put their images and idols. If you've ever seen the inside of a Roman Catholic church, they 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 put niches, little hollows in the walls where they put images, the statues of their patron saints and of the angels and and uh, saint this and saint that and just images, statues. And and so the camera happened to to glance past one of them. So I knew it was a Roman Catholic church. It had to be a Roman Catholic church. And of course, the the pews were there. I could see the pews. They weren't individual chairs or seating. They were strip uh, pews like you normally see in a church. And Nancy Pelosi was apparently standing at a podium. We could hear her voice clearly telling these Roman Catholic invaders quote, this is your country, unquote. So so this idea of, of, of Biden being the first Roman Catholic president to open the borders of this country to invaders, Roman Catholic invaders, is a pipe dream. They've been doing it for decades and decades and decades, okay? They are Catholicizing what used to be Protestant America. It's the only real threat that Rome has ever experienced, the Protestant Reformation, and it has to be destroyed. That's what the Holy Alliance was about in R.W. Thompson's book uh, and, and, and all many of the other books that I read where Roman Catholic countries in Europe emptied the prisons, emptied the, the, the uh, criminals, put them on trains and ships and sent them to this country to help Catholicize the United States of America. And that's what's being done and has been being done for 40 years at least in this country. And that just an uninterrupted uh, area. We've already discussed how they did it with the Irish, with the potato famine, and they, they flooded New York City with Irish Roman Catholics. They got control of the politics on the eastern seaboard, what used to be Protestant colonies. There was only one colony in the whole eastern seaboard that was Roman Catholic, and it was Maryland. The rest of them were staunchly Protestant, and they forbid the practice of, of Catholicism. They couldn't send. They couldn't say mass in this country. They couldn't uh, observe Christmas. They couldn't observe the Roman Catholic traditions. And so the Holy Alliance, way back in Pope Pius IX time, the time of the Civil War, they unloaded all the prisons of Roman Catholic Europe, what little was left of it after the Protestant Reformation. They sent them over to this country to make sure Protestantism didn't get a firm hold of this country. And then first thing you know, first thing you know, we have religious liberty, okay? All of a sudden, Roman Catholicism can practice and prosper. And now they have control. They have control of politics. They have control of education. They have control of the state house. They even have control of your local municipal government. And they're going to let those Catholics and non-Catholics even, heathens and heretics all, come into this country because they're serving a Roman Catholic purpose. And that is to destroy every vestige of what once was a Protestant nation. And it has to be done or the papacy is still in threat. The papacy's existence still is threatened. If the Protestants ever comprehend that futurism is a lie, that the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy is, the, is was, and always will be the papacy, and they give up that pipe dream of a 2,000-year gap between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel and realize that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, then they have, to real, they have to realize, they simply must realize that the papacy, just as has always been claimed by God's fearing people, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. We'll finally return to sanity. 
That's the only way we're ever going to close the border. That's the only way we're ever going to put the papal antichrist back into his box. That's the only way we're going to stop this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And you've got to answer the question, do you own this information now? Or is this just Tom's, Tom's opinion or Yerk's opinion? Don't look for the government to acknowledge that this is a Roman Catholic invasion. Don't let the government, don't wait for the government to acknowledge that borders are open to destroy Protestantism in this country. You have to be able to see it for yourself. It's up to you. Are you going to be a warrior in this battle or are you going to be a spectator? Look, here's another thing I have to address. Just a second, Tom. Because you yes. mentioned Christmas, I put this picture up. Public notice. The observation of Christmas having been deemed a sacrilege, the exchanging of gifts and greetings, dressing and fine clothing, feasting and similar satanical practices are hereby forbidden, with the offender liable to a fine of five shillings. This okay. is an original note from the United States before it even became the United States of, uh, I think it was still colonial times. Yeah. And he has another, was illegal and Christmas and here's another illegal. one. This is from 1653, as you can see, imprinted at London for G. Horton, 1563. The vindication of Christmas or his 12 years observations upon the times if concerning, no. Oh, yeah. Con concerning the lamentable game called Sweepstake, acted by General Plunder and Major General Texas, with his exhortation of the people, a description of that oppressing ringworm called Exercise, and the manner how high and mighty the Christmas ale uh, that formerly would knock down Hercules and strip and blah 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 blah. So this is. Uh, again, the vindication of Christmas or his 12-year observations. Yeah. I bring good cheer, old Christmas welcome. Do not hear, do not fear, do not fear. Yeah. <laughs> so these these things were printed against Christmas uh, even in the colonial time, 1653. That was before the founding of the United States of America, which was 1770, uh, 1789. Yeah. Uh, just I I just wanted to bring this up to 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 show that. Um, um, that is uh, not something that you are just inventing here as we go along. These Royal Mail stamps were affixed to specially designed envelopes and postmark the first day that the stamps were issued. Uh, is it um, Thomas Cranmer? No, this has nothing to do with Christmas. Uh, Christmas stamps, yeah. Okay, they were, they were sold at Christmas. So I just I just wanted to, 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 to let people know that, Tom. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you here, but I thought when you mentioned this uh, Christmas thing, it's an interesting point to show the people this public notice that has been uh, as used as a flyer even in the 17th century in uh, colonial America to show that Protestants, who were the overwhelming majority of uh, inhabitants in that time uh, in that country, are, have nothing to do with this pagan um, feast of Christmas or Saturnalia or Mistras or whatever you want to call it. So please, Tom, uh, finish your point, please. Well, uh, my, my whole point uh, was to, dis to, to describe to the listeners and show them facts on the ground that verifies <clears throat> that when the Pope opens his mouth, the governments of the world obey him. And that's why our Roman Catholic government is insisting that the border in Texas be open. Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, be open to Southern invasion. And it doesn't matter what the state governments say, it's going to happen. And it's been happening for 40 years. What I want you to know, this has not a damn thing to do with dem democracy or republicanism. Okay? They're going to make it look like the red shirts are against the blue shirts, and the blue shirts against the red shirts. They're going to shift the onus of blame 
onto politics in this country. But I want you to know that that's just a smokescreen. They're all in this together. And it's the Catholicization of the United States. They're a, they are obeying Roman Catholic social doctrine. They're tearing down the Protestantism of this country to make America Catholic because it's the only thing that prevents the Pope from taking the throne in this Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this country still, to this day, until Protestantism is routed out of this world, shakes in his boots in fear of what may happen should the world become Protestant. Should they ever return to the Scripture? Should they ever return to the Bible? Should they ever return to Christ and the God of gods in heaven? The Pope's throne is toast. And the Pope just can't have it. And as long as he controls the people and passes himself off as a Christian, and ignorant, blind, deaf, and dumb apostates believe it, and the governments of the world obey it, this world is going to be Catholic. It's going to be anti-Christian. And any so-called, quote-unquote, Bible-believing Christian fundamentalists are going to be destroyed with a fervor like you haven't seen since the since the Inquisitions, since the Crusades. And they'll all think they're doing God's service. When one of them kills you, they will throw a party. When someone kills you, there will be jubilation in their heaven. They will all think they're doing God's service. Now, let me ask you one final question to open your eyes. This will open your eyes like nothing else. When they kill you, they will think they are doing God's service. That's what it says in the Bible. Now, who wants to do God's service? Those who call themselves Christians. So who are your worst enemies? Who is it that wants to kill you? Who is it that wants to do God's service by killing you? Those who think they are God's servants. Those who think they are Christians but are not. Let that one sink in. That might take a week or a month to sink in. But your most dangerous adversaries are those with whom you eat at table. Does that remind you of anything? There was one at Jesus' table who betrayed him and who sought to kill him and who sent others to arrest him. And he sold him for 30 pieces of silver. That's what you're going to see right in the churches. Now, let me give you a glimmer of hope. I mean, it's about time for a little hope, isn't there? Isn't it? When all this happens, we can say the very same thing that Jesus said, because we're his, right? He's our king. And the Bible's our constitution. And he is heir to this creation. He is heir to this creation. And we are joint heirs with him. So that makes us like him in that respect, right? What did Jesus say when they came to arrest him and accuse him of treason against the Roman government? 
Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my people would fight. But we didn't fight, did we? Because we're in his kingdom, and it's not time for fighting. But that day is fast approaching. But for those who are so disillusioned and thinking, my God, my God, my country is being destroyed right before my very eyes, what am I going to do? Let me correct you. This is not your country. This is not your country. Any more than Jerusalem was Jesus' country. He said, my country is not of this world, and neither is yours, and neither is mine. Let happen whatever Satan is going to do in this country, just like Jesus said to, to, to uh, Judas when he betrayed him. He said this, what you must do, do quickly. Okay? That's our attitude to the governor of Texas, to the president of the United States, to all the Roman Catholics who are flooding into this country to destroy this country, to destroy Protestantism in this country. Here's what I say. What you must do, do quickly. And if you kill me, I only go to my reward. But you will pay for every drop of blood you, of mine that you shed. Because I am bought with a price. I am not my own. My Heavenly Father owns me. He created me. He saved me. He redeemed me. He reconciled me. And we have peace. I have Him as my Father. I have Christ as my Lord and, and heir, heir, heir and joint, and I am joint heir with him. All of this creation is mine. And when God routes out all the wickedness and all the evil from it, we will have it. And we will have it in peace and harmony and unity with him. Your kingdom is not of this world any more than your king is of this world. And you are no less an heir of this world than is Christ, your Redeemer. That's pretty good words, isn't it? That's pretty good hope, isn't it? Now, are you going to get overly depressed when the flooding continues out of the, Me the Mexican border with Texas? Are you going to get so depressed as to be suicidal when your bank account disappears? When, some, when you come home and you find some Mexican or some Asian or Taiwanese living in your house and you can't evict them? Are you going to be suicidal when they drive off with your car and your bank account and your land and even the clothes on your back if they, if you, if they can get them off of you? I'm going to say the same thing Paul said of himself. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Because when this life is over, my new life begins. And that's what I live for today. Back to you, Yerk. To me, Christ is life and death is gain. So be of good cheer because I have overcome the world, the Lord said. Yeah, there is not much to add to what you said, Tom. I think that we are to postpone our reading until next time because we have almost almost reached an hour. And I think that everything that will be said now is uh, superfluous to what has been said. Um, this was a wonderful sermon that you gave. And uh, we should never, ever forget to mention with all these books that we have read and that we are advising people to get that the most important book is this one the bible god's word god's inerrant word where he pays the dues that he has against us because he created us so he is in debt of making himself known to us and that's what he does with that book and if you want to know god 
don't go and study theology or something. Don't go into a church and listen to these lying pastors, reverends, priests, or whatever is there on the top of the pulpit. Just go in your room, close the door, turn on the light, get to your closet, get the Bible out, open up the Bible and read wherever you want. Because whatever page you will open, the only thing that you will find is truth and comfort and hope. And with that, I'll leave it until next week. Read your Bible. Shalom. Maranatha.